It's not unusual for best-selling books to be adapted into movies. It's also not unusual for these adaptions to completely miss the mark. There's no shortage of challenges when it comes to effectively translating complex characters, situations, and tone from a full-length novel into a movie or series. Just ask the creators of Netflix's recent adaption of Persuasion or Time Traveler's Wife. While some get it right, it's become increasingly apparent that the critics believe where the crawdads sing falls into the category of those that don't. But much like the main character herself, Kaya, the movie endures despite its harshest critics. While critics give the film a dismal 34%, audiences, on the other hand, love it. In fact, its audience score in Rotten Tomatoes comes in at a super high 96%, and the movie has already earned almost five times its budget, totaling $110 million worldwide. And I find the dichotomy between audience and critics is similar to the dichotomy of strong and weak parts of this film. For every strong element, there's an almost equal weaker opposing element. I'm Karen, and I had no idea what a crawdad was before watching this movie. In this video, I'm going to give you a rundown of what the movie is about, why the main survival theme is so compelling, the issues created by the glossy look and feel of the film, and finally, I'll decide whether the main character, Kaya, is too perfect. But first, let's discuss what the movie is actually about. Where the Crawdads Sing is part martyr mystery, part coming of age story, and part love story. Catherine Clark, also known as Kaya, is abandoned by her destitute family in a remote North Carolina marsh. Fast forward years later, and Kaya is on trial for murder of a local golden boy, Chase Andrews. As the case unfolds, she recounts her story of an isolated childhood, befriending and falling in love with a boy named Tate, and her ill-fated relationship with Chase. Now, as much as I love to read, I actually haven't read the original book, so this review is going to be based solely on the movie. The survival theme was, for me, the most compelling part of the entire film. We watch Kaya struggle to survive from those first moments when she's being chased by the police to her fending for herself as a child, all the way until the end when she's being hounded by Chase. Even in the scenes that aren't about survival, like when Tate is teaching her to read, it still has this element of independence and grit. All of this culminates beautifully at the end of the film when the central question about what it means for her to survive is answered and it hits you like a very large swamp boat. Uh, the ending doesn't linger and it doesn't overexplain, just like Kaya. Like I mentioned earlier, however, there is an equally weak element to this survival theme. Perhaps it's because I watch a lot of crime dramas, but those courtroom and trial scenes were just really clunky and poorly executed. Kaya's coming-of-age story is wrapped around a court case where she's on trial for her life for the murder of Chase. The story bounces back and forth between the events leading up to the trial and the trial itself. The opening and closing speeches prepared by the lawyers are unimaginative and the crowd gasps and boos seemingly to guide the audience's feelings rather than reacting to what's actually happening. And then, of course, there's the criminal case itself. A standout example of ridiculousness is when a key bit of evidence, a red hat, is presented to the court to connect Kaya to the murder. Pieces of the hat are found on Chase's clothing, which matches a red hat found in Kaya's house. It turns out, of course, that this is Tate's hat that he gave to Kaya. But of course, no one seems to ask the pretty obvious question like, is this actually a woman's hat? Has anyone ever seen her wearing this hat? And yes, it's true that the biased nature of the townspeople could lead them to cobble together some ridiculous evidence, but if that's the case, there's no effort made by the writer to make it clear that it's intentional, which of course makes me think that it's not. Those trial scenes are mercifully short and only somewhat distracts from the more interesting parts of the story. Critics of the film, as well as lovers of the book, generally don't like the aesthetics of this movie. From that first opening shot, we see this North Carolina marsh from a bird's eye view. It's lush and bright and brimming with life and ruggedly beautiful, and it's depicted the same way throughout the entire film. Basically, the marsh has gotten the Hollywood treatment and is crafted like something out of a Nicholas Sparks novel. 
There's no sweat, there's no mugginess or true dilapidation. Now, this might be a point of contention, but I actually like this approach and thought it worked well for the story because it shows us this landscape as Kaya would see it. But the glossy Hollywood treatment doesn't stop there. It invades other elements from the characters themselves to the 1960s societal norms. A prime example is Kaya's love interest, Chase and Tate, two generically beautiful men who look mostly the same except for some differences to their wardrobe and mannerisms, which distinguish them as the bad boy and the good guy. But the more unfortunate part of this is that their background stories are too simplistic, which makes their motivations feel shaky. I mean, Kaya is known in Berkeley Cove as the marsh girl. She's supposed to be some sort of marsh creature with eyes that glow. Are you seriously telling me that not one, but two of the most good looking men in this entire village randomly want to date her? Uh, anyway, Kaya's pseudo caretakers, an African-American couple who own a general goods store, Jumpin' and Mabel, are similarly painted with wide brushstrokes. Although these two are integral characters to Kaya's story, we don't learn anything about their backstories or their motivations. They serve only to give us a fleeting glimpse at race relations in the 1960s South, but are firmly established as the good guys, whose only function is to help push the story forward. These faintly drawn supporting characters are in sharp contrast to Kaya's character, who's played by the fantastic Daisy Edgar Jones. She's arguably too gorgeous for someone who's supposed to be labeled as the Marsh Girl, again, reinforcing that Hollywood shine. But to her credit, she plays the role brilliantly. While other characters lack depth in their performances, Edgar Jones does a wonderful job mixing intelligence and shyness, emotion, and curiosity into her performance. But while Kaya is faced with her fair share of problems caused by the not insignificant number of Barclay Cove villains, is her character crafted as being too perfect and too capable? And this led me to wonder, is Kaya a Mary Sue? But before we go into this topic, let's talk about what a Mary Sue actually is. Mary Sue is a term originating from fan fiction and is a trope that refers to a character, usually female, who is depicted as unrealistically lacking flaws or weaknesses. And this is important because Mary Sue's tend to be really boring characters. If they don't have failings to overcome during the course of the story, then it's hard for us as the audience to get invested in them. The actual characteristics of a Mary Sue can vary depending on the source, but here's a rundown of five traits that most people tend to agree on. Number one, Mary Sues usually possess skills and abilities that are not consistent with their situation and personal history. They can do unrealistic things and they can do them better than anyone else. Number two, they are universally loved and embraced by every good character that they meet even when there's no logical reason for this to happen. Number three, they possess flawless, idealized personalities that no person can actually live up to, like giving into greed, anger, or jealousy. Number four, they always make good decisions and strive to do what's right in every situation. And number five, they never seriously get challenged, fail at anything, or beaten by anyone. Success and victory comes easy to them. So let's compare these characteristics to Kaya. Point number one, it's fair to say that Kaya is in a pretty disadvantaged situation. Her family lives in an isolation. She grows up without attending a formal school. She may learn some of the basics from Mabel, but other than that, Kaya is illiterate even when she is a teenager. Despite all of this, she is taught by Tate to read in what seems to be about a year, and then goes on later to publish a book about marshland wildlife. Kaya is framed as a highly intelligent woman. She is observant, she is quick. Despite this, it seems pretty unrealistic to me that she can learn to read and write so quickly, especially from Tate, who is a teenager himself, without any formal teacher training. You could argue that her lack of obligations would allow her to spend more time during the day to learn, to read and write, but remember that Kaya lives by herself and she supports herself. If you tally up all the time that it must take her to feed herself and to clothe herself and to maintain her house and then weigh that 
against all the spare time that Tate, who is a star student himself, must have to teach her, then that's probably not much time to actually dedicate to her education. Therefore, I think it's accurate to say that her skills go beyond her situation. Point number two, a significant part of the premise is that residents of Barkley Cove are prejudiced towards Kaya. She's labeled as the demon marsh girl. You may see this and think, well, she's not universally loved, therefore she can't be a Mary Sue. Well, it's noteworthy that this point comes with a very important caveat, and that is that she's loved by every good character that we meet. We've established earlier in this review that there's a handful of characters like Tate and Mabel and Jumpin and her lawyer and her publishers who lack depth and background that enable them to be lumped into the good characters category. And it's their lack of concrete motivation that this point is founded on. While Tate has a slightly more justifiable motivation to befriend Kaya because of their brief history as children, Chase is given almost no real motivation to seek out Kaya given both of their backgrounds and her reputation as the Marsh Girl. In the film, at least, Chase is painted as arrogant and self-conscious and self-serving. Without deeper context on Chase as a person, it's hard to understand how this quickly develops into a logical romantic relationship. Point number three. Before we go further into this point though, I think it's important to emphasize that Kaya is constantly in dangerous or difficult situations. An idealized personality in this context doesn't mean that she isn't devoid of emotion like fear or anger. Rather that Kaya's emotional reactions are highly appropriate to almost every situation that she's in. When she's faced with the possibility of a death sentence, for example, during her trial, she reacts bravely and remains collected throughout the entire ordeal. There is no expression of jealousy when Kaya finds out that Chase is engaged, or hubris when she publishes her first novel. From childhood, she's ingrained with this notion that she should be isolated to protect herself from the world, but this is quickly overcome when both Chase and when Tate come into the picture. Essentially, Kaya has no character flaws that could potentially undermine her aspirations. She's faced with uh, several interpersonal conflicts throughout the movie, and although at times she reacts with anger, Kaya is very quick to forgive. Take, for example, Kaya's reaction when Tate tells her that he's leaving and also when he returns. Kaya shows her anger, but is very quick to forgive him, even though he's ghosted her for like years. And of course, it is arguable that the writers needed to do this to keep the story moving, but there's certainly no overreaction or um, emotions towards others that are excessive. Finally, in instances when she's extremely afraid or has extreme anger, such as when Chase attacks her or when Child Services shows up, the film frames this as extremely justified. For every situation, there is an equal and justified response that never conflicts with her goals. Now, these last two points are tricky, and I did actually go back and watch the movie again so that I could check my assumptions. There's no debate that Kyle's childhood is lacking suitable role models. She's abused, she is neglected, she is abandoned by almost everyone closest to her. Now, Kaya is supposed to be very intelligent and instinctual, but it's surprising just how Kaya always seems to leap from one good decision to the next and never stumbles, never makes a mistake, or has to rethink her approach. From a young age, she teaches herself how to gain a source of income. She writes and publishes a book when the need arises and afterwards has little difficulty navigating the legal system to get the deed to her house. Now, you could definitely nitpick this point. Kaya's decisions not to return to school, her inability to see Chase for what he is, and her decisions not to go for the plea bargain are debatable. And all of these are indeed challenges that her character must overcome. But I think it's safe to say that overall, Kaya's choices are conveniently and consistently good. Point number five. Now, I'll admit that this last point is highly debatable, and it's probably the one on this list that I think can be seen in a couple of different ways. 
It's clear that Kaya is faced with some incredibly challenging situations. When we first meet her, she is on trial for murder. When she's a child, she is abandoned by her family and she's forced to fend for herself. And she's put through the ringer in two serious relationships. But what makes Kaya drift more into this Mary Sue territory on this point for me is that she never really fails at anything and success does appear to come easy to her. She's successful at feeding herself and clothing herself as a young child. We never see her rejected by her publishers. She easily learns to read and write as a teenager. And of course, she takes revenge on the main antagonist in, in an almost impossible way. All this leads me to conclude that Kaya certainly has the characteristics of a Mary Sue. Any flaws or weaknesses that she does have, such as naivety or extreme isolation, are minor and aren't really approached as problems that need significant attention to overcome. Rather, this film is positioned as Kaya overcoming the failings of others like Chase and Tate and the townspeople rather than her own. Sure, it would have been more compelling if Kaya was flawed or made mistakes, but I'm actually surprised at how much I still was interested in her character despite all of this. It's Kaya's difficult circumstances which makes her journey ultimately compelling. Where the Crawdads Sing certainly has its fair share of issues from its underdeveloped, simplistic supporting characters, to its uninteresting trial scenes and its clunky dialogue. But despite all of this, Kaya's story of survival is gripping and the aesthetics make it a real treat to watch. In other words, the film seems to have created its own twisted form of survival, just like the lead character herself. I give Where the Car Dad Sings three out of five stars. So do you agree or disagree with the fact that Kaya is too perfect or too capable? Do you side with its harsh critics or did you actually enjoy the movie? Share your thoughts in the comments. Thanks for watching and I will see you next time.